When Tim Ansel founded the Creative Assembly in 1987, the company simply ported already released games to different platforms. And even though these simple projects had made the company quite a bit of money, they eventually decided to try their hand at an original title. They decided to jump on the real-time strategy bandwagon and make a quick knockoff of Command & Conquer. But when, on a whim, they decided to test a 3D map, they realized that they could make the kind of game that no one else had ever done before. After more time, work, and money than they had intended to spend, the result was Shogun Total War, a landmark strategy game and a success beyond anything the Creative Assembly had ever done before. A sequel was inevitable. And indeed it came, but when it did, the gaming community would find that Total War had traveled through time. In August of 2001, the Creative Assembly announced Crusader Total War. Abandoning the struggles of feudal Japan in favor of the Mediterranean, the game would feature the exploits of knights, barbarians, and warriors of the Holy Land. However, only three months later, the company changed the name of the game to Medieval Total War. The name change reflected two things. First, the game had expanded to encompass a large chunk of medieval history, nearly four centuries in all much more time than the Crusades would cover. And second, the events of September 11th, 2001 suddenly put the word Crusader in a whole new light that the Creative Assembly did not want to associate themselves with. The game itself would take the real-world tactics approach of the first game and expand on it. A major addition the team added was Siege Warfare. Technically, Shogun had also featured castle battles, but the walls had been indestructible barriers around an always open door. For medieval, a castle siege would involve numerous siege weapons that could take down walls, doorways, and defenses, completely changing the tactics of these battles. Additionally, the player didn't have to fight this battle if he didn't want to. He had the option to simply maintain the siege and starve the defenders into submission. The war could be won without firing a single arrow. This time around, the game would also feature a separate mode that allowed the player to fight a historical battle. The mission would start with the player in the exact situation that the real-world commander had found himself in, and it would be up to the player to either uphold or overturn history. With a campaign that could be started in three different periods of the medieval era, plus a still-addicting multiplayer, Medieval Total War was another smash hit upon its release in 2002. The company was doing great and was starting to give itself more work than its England-based studio could handle. And so they decided to set up a second studio on the other side of the world, in Brisbane, Australia. On its founding, the Brisbane studio was tasked with handling overflow work from their mother company, but as the years went on, the studio would make several titles all on its own. But for the next two years, both studios focused on one game, the next in the Total War franchise, but this time went back even further in time, to the classical world of ancient Rome. And for their Roman epic, they'd be undergoing the biggest single change since the series had started. The legions would be represented in full 3D. In Shogun and Medieval, the soldiers themselves had been low-res 2D sprites in a beautifully rendered 3D world, which limited how far down they wanted the camera to go. So while the battles entire looked amazing, the actual fighting was practically unwatchable. For Rome, they wanted the player to sink down into the fighting and watch his troops slog it out with the enemy, with full animations and vibrant colors across thousands of soldiers. They set straight to work on this aspect of the game, and by early 2003, already had it looking amazing. In fact, it looked so good that they couldn't contain their enthusiasm. They chose to go to E3 2003 with their demo fully a year and a half before they planned to release the game. Their publisher, Activision, thought that this was far too early in the development cycle, and that Creative Assembly would just embarrass themselves by showing pre-alpha code to the public. Instead, against all odds, this bare-bones version of the game won massive acclaim and several awards for strategy game of the show. It was a sign of things to come. So successful was the demonstration that before the game was even finished, Creative Assembly got calls from not one, but two different TV channels the History Channel in the United States, 
and BBC Two from the United Kingdom. The History Channel had made plenty of Roman documentaries that featured a few actors in cheap costumes, but they could never document large-scale historical battles. The still incomplete Rome Total War engine allowed them to show ancient battles completely accurately, with thousands of virtual soldiers showing how the battle played out in decisive battles. The BBC took a different approach, turning the technology into a game show that pit ordinary citizens against the great generals of history in Time Commanders. For the Creative Assembly, these shows got the Total War name into more households than any marketing campaign could have achieved. And what was seen in the TV shows wasn't even the final product. When the game did release, the engine was even more beautiful than what people had come to expect. Its sound design as well surpassed the bar that medieval Total War had set, making the game so engaging to watch up close that it was easy to forget about the rest of the battlefield. <laughs> campaign mode, often cited as the weakest part of the series, was streamlined, with an option to play a short campaign instead of the traditional long one. The government of the player's cities was also tweaked to be as deep or shallow as the gamer wanted. For hardcore players, generals could now also act as governors, with each commander having a skill level in both the political and military spheres. Sending a commander off to battle now meant an economic penalty for the city, making micromanagement incredibly strategic. Or, for aggressive gamers who wanted to get straight to the fight, there was now a setting to make the city governments completely automatic, so that a master tactician could just worry about his army's movements and leave the paperwork to the AI. All told, it was universally heralded as a landmark achievement in strategy gaming, and is often cited as one of the greatest games in the PC market. The company was now a major gaming studio on a roll. But in the immediate future, both their vaunted series and the Creative Assembly itself would undergo the biggest changes since their founding. Tune in next time to see how another company conquered total war.